Uprising, Chapter 15, Jane, page 138. Mr. Corrigan just stood there. But your father, Miss Millhouse, I said put her in the car, Jane commanded, and for the first time in her life, she thought she sounded a little bit like her father. He was always that forceful, ordering the servants around. Mr. Corrigan gave Jane a puzzled glance, but he obediently bent over and scooped the wailing girl into his arms. Bella, screamed the boy hovering nearby. She clutched, he clutched at the girl's hand, but she shoved him away. I don't think Bella wants you to come with her, Jane said, and she was just as glad. This boy looked like a complete ragamuffin, one of those urchins who stood on the street corners hawking papers or picking pockets. His knickers were in tatters and no one had bothered to patch any of the holes in his shirt. His thick hair st straggled down to his eyes. Was his family poor too? Poor even to own, was his family too poor even to own scissors or just too lazy to use them? Mr. Corrigan turned his back on the boy, shielding Bella from the boy's grasp. Bella's body must have been very light because Mr. Corrigan needed only one arm to hold her up while he tugged on the hand <clears throat> while he tugged on the handle of the car door. Then he slid her onto a seat. Miss, he said, offering Jane one last chance to come to her senses and cast the girl back out into the street. You ran into her, Jane said fiercely. She's in pain and in mourning, and we can help. Mr. Corrigan shrugged, his head bowed, a servant's answer. It is as you command, that shrug said. That shrug said, I will not pretend that I am capable of thinking for myself. I will let you know how she is, Jane said to Yetta as if Yetta had asked. Yetta's face was unreadable. But she gave a small nod. Miss Wellington, shall I pull up the car? Shall I pull the car around for you? Mr. Corrigan said. Jane saw what he meant. He put Bella on the side of the car that was closest to the curb. Unless he turned the car around, Jane would have to step out into traffic to get to get to the door on the other side. No, no, I'll be fine, Jane said airily. But it was frightening stepping out into the street. A car zigzagged past her, blaring its horn. She had to dodge horse droppings and she had to dodge horse droppings and she moved so rapidly that Mr. Corrigan didn't have time to step out before her hold hold the door for her for the first time in her life Jane grasped the handle of the car door herself opening and shutting it without her driver's assistance home please she instructed Mr. Corrigan he pulled away from the curb Jane turned her attention to Bella who was no longer thrashing out and screaming, but huddled on the seat, sobbing softly. She did not seem to realize that she'd been transferred from the sidewalk to the car. On the whole, she was not much cleaner or any better kempt than the ragamuffin, than the ragamuffin boy. The hair hiding her face might as well have been tied in knots, and Jane wasn't sure if that was dirt or blood on her arm. Jane suffered a pang of regret. What have I done? But her next thought was triumphant. I did something. Finally. For once. I'm not just standing around watching. Jane couldn't have said why she'd begun haunting the picket line the past, oh, the past few weeks. Whenever she could escape Miss Milhouse's watchful eye, she sneaked out of Christmas brunches, Christmas luncheons, Christmas teas, just to have Mr. Corrigan drive her down to Triangle Factory to stand in the cold. Her fingers frostbit. Her elaborate hairstyle so often destroyed by the wind. She disgusted herself. It would be different if she were actually helping. Bringing hampers of food, maybe, or joining the voice with the strikers. Or voice with the strikers as they called out to passersby. Or even as Eleanor Kensington had done, throwing herself at a police officer. Begging, arrest me, arrest me instead of touching even one of these four poor girls. They're not doing anything. They're not doing a thing wrong. So if you have to arrest someone, arrest me. The police officer had carefully dodged her and walked in the other direction, as did the next police officer. No one, it seemed, was willing to arrest Eleanor Kensington. But Jane crept timidly away when the police came. She'd done nothing but watch. Until now, the girl on the seat beside her snuffled, one sob completely spent. The next whimper 
to the next just a whimper, building in her chest. Jane pulled out her handkerchief and slid it under that veil of tangled hair, awkwardly wiping the girl's nose. She mostly ended up wiping the handkerchief on the hair so that it wasn't exactly a successful effort. But the girl didn't seem to notice as the next sob grew from one little whimper to something truly frightening racking her whole body. Jane stared at the girl, wondering that she was capable of crying with such abandon. Such abandon. The way the girl had thrown herself to the ground wailing, it had been so sad, but also so pure. Jane remembered the moment she learned of her own mother's death. Miss Milhouse had told her she died in her sleep, completely at peace. You know she'd been sick for such a long time. Miss Milhouse's method of delivering the news had made it seem as though it would be selfish to cry. So Jane hadn't. She'd stood there, a little girl of nine, stoic and silent and pale, while Miss Milhouse began fussing about fittings for the morning clothes, for the morning clothes and the proper dress for the funeral. Jane wished now that she'd been able to wail like this girl. She wished such mourning had been considered proper or that she hadn't let herself care that it wasn't. Mr. Corrigan pulled into their long curving driveway. Shall I? he asked, still sounding doubtful that Jane really meant to be bringing this wailing girl home. Carry her upstairs, Jane ordered briskly. Mr. Milhouse was waiting. Miss Milhouse was waiting in the foyer. Where have you been? She demanded. The Aberfoyles party. I'm not going to the Aberfoyles party, Jane said. I'm busy. But all those eligible men coming home from college. Miss Milhouse caught a glimpse of the wailing girl in Mr. Corrigan's arms. She let out a shriek. What is this? It is a girl. Mr. Corrigan accidentally ran into her. She just lost her entire family, Jane said. Miss Milhouse recoiled. Well, then give her a few coins for pity and send her on her way, Miss Milhouse said, her face a mask of revulsion. You shouldn't have brought her here. For all, you shouldn't have brought her here. If she knows where we live, she'll come around begging for money all the time. She might even know a lawyer. And, ugh, she's so filthy. Downstairs, Mr. Corrigan, I put her in my room. Jane commanded, you can lay her on my bed. But your white cover, coverlet, Jean, that's mud on her boots. Mud or worse. Jane responded by tugging on the girl's boots, even as Mr. Corrigan carried her upstairs. The boots came off to reveal filthy patched stockings with equally dirty skin peeking through the holes. Draw a bath, Jane said. Well, I never. Jane Wellington, I'm not touching this verminous creature. And I forbid you to have anything to do with her either, Miss Milhouse said. Now, Mr. Corrigan, I insist, take her back where she belongs. Mr. Corrigan kept walking up the stairs. So there, Jane thought, I am the mistress of the house. Miss Milhouse is just a servant. This was a new thought, a surprise. Mr. Corrigan gently set the girl down on Jane's bed. He himself walked into Jane's private bathroom and turned on the faucets. And then he retired to Jane's room, pulling Miss Milhouse along with him and gently shutting the doors behind them. Jane was alone with the filthy, sobbing girl. Some of the dirt and snot from her face, Jane saw, had already been transferred to the white coverlet. The sound of the water rushing into the bathtub caught Jane's attention. She went into the bathroom and turned the faucets off. She wet a cloth and brought it back to the bed, but the water dripped across the sheets. She tugged on the girl's arm. You'll have to come with me, she said. Dazed, still crying, the girl stumbled to her feet and swayed her way toward the bathroom. Jane thought about summoning her newest Irish maid, Brady, who'd replaced Sally, Britty was especially good at washing hair. Britty would know how to wash away all that filth, but Britty might complain to Miss Milhouse, might decline to help because she had been hired only to take care of Jane. And Britty wasn't the gentlest of maids. Jane didn't want Britty pulling on Bella's hair when Bella was already sobbing so tragically. Jane touched Bella's dress, ready to lift it over the girl's shoulders. Jane had had maid dresses and undress Jane had had maids dress and undress her many times 
but she never once tried to help anyone else with their clothes. She couldn't figure out how it would work. Bella pulled away, murmuring something that sounded vaguely like an Italian version of, I can do it myself. Dialect, Jane thought. She remembered a line from one of her Italian guidebooks. In the countryside, and particularly in Mezzogiorno, Giorno, in the southern part of Italy, the peasants have no knowledge of their own language and instead only instead speak only localized dialect. A peasant from one village may be completely incapable of conversing with a peasant from another village, only scant miles away. It is recommended that travelers avoid these areas entirely. Bella slipped into the tub as soon as she had her clothes off. Jane had never seen another girl without at least stays and petticoat on. She was stunned to see how badly Bella's ribs stuck out, how thin and wobbly her legs appeared. It was the fashion to pull one's corset very tight to make a female's waist all but disappear. But Jane had never seen someone as skeletal as Bella, so clearly on the verge of starvation, on the verge of disappearing completely. I, I'll go tell the kitchen to send up a tray of food while you're bathing, Jane stammered. Here's a towel for when you're done. And here, you can put on one of my nightgowns. It was bright daylight outside mid-morning, but Jane had the sense that someone as emaciated as Bella and as grief-stricken should definitely be convalescing in bed. She scrambled down the stairs so rattled that she forgot she could summon any service she wanted by just ringing a bell. In the kitchen, she spat out orders at the undercooks, then carried a tray of oatmeal and eggs and bacon upstairs herself. Bella was out of the tub now, wearing the nightgown and curled up under the coverlet. She was also sound asleep. Jane leaned in close to make sure that Bella was still breathing, and then she sat down beside the bed and watched because she didn't know what else to do. Only it didn't feel like just watching anymore. It felt like keeping guard.